I want to welcome each and every one of you. We're glad that you're in church. It's good to be in church. Uh, we want to welcome everybody that's tuning in to our YouTube channel. Please be sure to hit that little thumbs up. Subscribe to the channel. We put out content, try to, every single day. So subscribe. Put out Bible verses as well as little shorts. So we appreciate that. Today we are going to be in Hebrews chapter 10. We're also going to be in Ephesians chapter 2, so throw some bookmarks there. And we're going to start in Romans chapter 8, so grab your Bibles, throw some bookmarks in those two, in Hebrews 10 and Ephesians 2, and turn to Romans 8 with me. And we're going to start there. We're going to start by listening to our Bible app and the whole chapter of Romans 8 as it reads the word to us. And as we listen to it, I want to ask you a question for you to ponder as you're listening to it. Do you ever feel unworthy? Do you ever feel like you shouldn't be able to approach God because of your sin? Do you ever feel too guilty to pray? Is Satan making you feel too ashamed to go to the throne of grace? These are questions that today, hopefully, we will be able to answer and as we are going through the word, as the Lord is revealing it to us, as we are listening to it, just go over those things in your mind. Do you have those questions? Do you have those guilt? Do you feel unworthy? And hopefully, by the end of the sermon today, we will realize that we should never feel too ashamed to come to the throne. So before we start and listen to the word, let's pray and we'll ask the teacher to be here. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you once again for allowing us to come before you. I pray, Lord, that as we go into your word today, you will just move me out of the way, that you will use me as you see fit, and anything that is said, Lord, just comes from you. I ask, Lord, that you guide the rest of the service, allow your spirit to pour out onto all of us as we hear your word and receive it. In Jesus' name, amen. So let's start in Romans Chapter 8. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin. He condemned sin in the flesh that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. So then, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. But you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not his. And if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his Spirit who dwells in you. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If indeed we suffer with him, 
that we may also be glorified together. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. Because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. Not only that, but we also, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves, groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. For we were saved in this hope. But hope that is seen is not hope. For why does one still hope for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with perseverance. Likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weaknesses. For we do not know what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Now he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is, because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called. Whom he called, these he also justified. And whom he justified, these he also glorified. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died, and furthermore is also risen who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. This might be, maybe a personal opinion, one of the best chapters in the Bible. It tells us so much. We start with, and kind of go through each little section here, and it's way too much to get into one sermon, so I'm going to give you the cliff note version. But it starts off telling us that there's two ways we can live, either in the flesh or in the spirit. And we gain something, might not be a good thing, depending on what we choose. If we choose to live in the flesh or follow after our sinful desires of our old life, the lust of the flesh, then this chapter tells us that we are at enmity with God. That's verse 7. We cannot please God, verse 8. And ultimately, it will bring us death. Verse 6 and 13. That is what we gain by deciding if we want to live in the flesh. Or we can choose to live by the Spirit. And with that, verse 2, we will have freedom. Verse 4, we will have righteousness. We will have life and peace. Verses 6, 10, 11, and 13. 
and the best is that we will be called the sons of God. Verses 14, 15, 16, and 17. The flip side, if we choose not to live in the spirit, and we choose to live in the flesh, is that we cannot be called the sons of God. We are choosing that if we choose to listen to our flesh as opposed to listen to our spirit. And I've said it in sermons before. I know that it is a very common thing to hear that we're all children of God. I cannot find a single verse in the Bible that says we are all children of God. Jesus' own words to the Pharisees is, you are of your father the devil, which means they were not children of God. And this verse, this section of verses tells us how we become children of God if we live in the spirit. And it's our choice. It is our choice if we decide we're going to live in the spirit, we're going to try to walk by the spirit, or if we are going to listen to our flesh. And as the knight says in Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade, choose wisely. Because one will bring death. Verses 18 through 30 tells us about the things that the Spirit guarantees if we walk in the Spirit. And it reminds us, verses 18 through 23, that we will suffer in this life. There will be suffering. And it says here, as all of God's creation suffers and groans. God created this world, and because of sin, because we as man have decided to allow sin into the world, it has corrupted what God originally planned and had created. Because of sin, our world is decomposing, there's pollution, there's disease, and there is death because of sin. And all of God's creation groans because of that. But we hear in this section of verses that there is a hope of deliverance. Not just for us, but for God's creation. There will be a new heaven, there will be a new earth. And it will be redeemed in the final day. And Jesus is coming back. Verses 24 and 25 talk of the hope we have for that redemption and his return and the corruptible things of this world to be cleansed and no longer be corruptible. And it talks of it as a hope because it is a hope that is not yet seen. It says it in that verse, and if it was a hope seen, it would be a reality. It wouldn't be hope. And as we wait for that hope, we eagerly wait, and hopefully we will persevere until the end. Verses 26 and 27 tells us that the Spirit will help us in our weaknesses. It tells us what we should pray for, and it will help us to ignore the flesh. It will bring life to our bodies that are here on earth. And that only applies if we feed the Spirit. If we focus more on our flesh, if we do things that strengthen the flesh, if we give in to the lusts of the flesh and we ignore the spirit, the spirit becomes weak, the flesh becomes strong, and it gets harder and harder to walk in the spirit when we give in to the flesh. And there's a story, a little story that's gone around for a while about an Indian, old Indian, and his grandson coming to him and giving him advice, him saying that, grandson, there is two wolves that live inside of each one of us. One is evil and wants to do bad, and one is good that wants to do good. And every day there is a battle between the two wolves. And the grandson says, how do I know which one will win? And he says, the one that you feed. And that is exactly 
what this section of verses is telling us. Because we have two wolves inside of us. One is the spirit and one is the flesh. Jesus said the spirit's willing but the flesh is weak. And the only way to not consistently give in to the flesh is to feed your spirit more. And we have daily bread that we ask Jesus for. And it is right here. We heard it. You can listen to it while you are washing the dishes. You can fall asleep to it. Most of us have some sort of app on our phone that will play the Bible for us. And even if you don't have a Bible app, most of us have YouTube on our phone. And you can find the same thing on YouTube. And the more that we feed the Spirit, the more that the Spirit will work in our lives. I have a quote before we go on to our next section of verses. This is from T.J. Bach. He's an old preacher back in the day. He said, The Holy Spirit longs to reveal to you the deeper things of God. He longs to love through you. He longs to work through you. Through the blessed Holy Spirit, you may have strength for every duty, wisdom for every problem, comfort in every sorrow, joy in his overflowing service. The Holy Spirit wants to work in our lives. And if we will allow him to, if we will feed him, if we will submit, we will have life in this life, and more importantly, life in the next. The next verse, verse 28, I want to read again. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. This is Romans 8.28. This is a verse that you all should underline, highlight, memorize. Romans 8.28. And as I have said, this might be one of the best chapters in the Bible. And if it is, this is the peak of that chapter. We can rest in the confidence in God, believing that he is in total control. And he will work out all things together for our good. And this is a promise for those who love the Lord. Those who are called according to his purpose. And you cannot claim that promise. Of all things working together for good. If we don't love the Lord. And if we do not answer the call. That is his purpose. We can't. <laughs> and. We have, again, the choice to decide, are we going to show him that we love him? Are we going to show him that we are called according to his purpose? Because if we show that we love him, if we answer the call, if we allow him to work and we work according to his purpose, then we know all things will work together for good. Jesus tells us in John 14, 15, if you love me, keep my commandments. It's pretty simple to show your love to the Lord. So my question to you all is, can you claim the promise of all things working together for good in your life? And if we can, then this is the assurance that we have. No matter what comes, good or bad, Rain or shine, hard or easy, darkness or light, ups or downs, sickness or health, no matter what comes in our lives, it will not make a difference because whatever comes, God will make sure it works together for good. No matter what. And if we can hold on to that truth, then we will understand that there is no accidents in life. Everything 
will work together for good. And as God's children will one day look back, just like Joseph did, and he said to his brothers in Genesis 50-20, what you meant for evil, God meant for good. That is what this chapter ends with. And it's the assurance that God is in total control. Verses 29 and 30 tells us that he has a plan for us. He knows us. And he has a plan for each and every one of you on what he wants for your life. And ultimately what we should be doing to show that we love him. Verses 31 through 39, it tells us about God's love and that there are five questions that if we know the answer, nothing should ever cause us to fear in this life. Verse 31, if God is for us, then who can be against us? There's an answer. That person doesn't matter, whether it be Satan or anybody who is on his side, because no one will prevail. If God is for us, it doesn't matter who's against us. No one. Verse 32, shall God not freely give us all things? He gave us Jesus. He gives us life, salvation, everything that we have in this life, everything we will have in the next life, and he wants to supply all of your needs. Philippians 4.19. Verse 33 who shall bring a charge against us? Again, Satan will try. And when he does, Jesus is going to say, it's paid in full. So the answer is, no one will bring a charge against us. Who will condemn us? Since only God can condemn and we're his children, the answer again is, no one. Verse 35, who can separate us from the love of Jesus? Again, no one. If we know the answers to all of those questions and we understand that there is no one, then nothing in this life should bother us. We should know that all, thing will work, all things will work together for good in our life. And we should, we should know it doesn't matter because God's on our side. Because we love him and we are doing his will. And it ends with, we are more than conquerors. We will win because Jesus already won. And we know this for sure. Death cannot separate us from him. This life, as hard as it can be, can't separate us from him. Nothing that comes today, nothing that comes tomorrow, nothing that comes anything in our life will separate us from him as long as we want to stay close to him. Again, it is our choice. And this chapter starts with, there's no condemnation. It ends with, there is no separation. And right there in the middle, all things work together for good. It is an awesome chapter. And the best thing is, this chapter applies to you if you just accept the gift. That's all you have to do is accept the gift. You cannot earn it. It is already paid in full. And we're going to see that. Turn with me now to Ephesians chapter 2. We're going to read Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. And you he made alive who were dead in trespass and sins in which you once walked according to the course of the world, according to the prince of powers of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of our flesh, and it, of the mind we were natural na nature children of wrath, just as the others. Right there, before we go on. We used to be children of flesh. Before salvation, we used to walk in disobedience. We used to give in to our flesh. And we should not be doing that anymore. Verse number four. 
But God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together for Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up together, and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Right there in the middle, verses four through nine, we are saved by grace. It is through our faith in Jesus and his blood Everyone gained it the same way, through faith, not through works, so that none of us can boast. None of us. Nobody, nobody, nobody has ever achieved salvation through their own effort or works. Nobody. And if we are saved, then it should be visible in our life. There's a lot of Christians out there that have no evidence in their lives that they are saved. They claim that they are Christian, and they have an attitude that we'll go over in a minute here, but works don't save a person, but they should be evidence to those around you that you are saved and you live for Jesus. Verse 10 says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. We should walk in good works to show we appreciate what Jesus did for us. And we should walk in good works because God prepared them beforehand for us to walk in. We should have an attitude as Christians once we have been saved and through our rest of our lives, I have salvation. And because of that, I want to live for you, Jesus. I want to show you that I appreciate what you've done to me, done for me. So what do you want me to do? What is your plan for me? I'm willing. That should be our attitude. It should not be, unfortunately, as most Christians that I said a minute ago, it should not be the attitude of, well, now I'm saved, so that's taken care of. Got that handled. Salvation, check it off the list, and now I can just go on with my life as normal. As long as I don't sin, as long as I go to church, good to go. And I am not here to tell you that that attitude will send you to hell. I don't know if it will. I just know that we should be living our lives for Christ. And while I don't think it will send you to hell, in my opinion, because there were people, example, a thief on a cross who, right there at the end, got salvation and had no good works. But a point I'm trying to make is salvation should produce good works. It should produce them for those to see around us that we live for Jesus. But good works will not save you. Peter, James, John, Paul, name them, any of the apostles, saints, whatever you want to call them, did mighty things for the kingdom of God. They healed they started churches. They did a lot of things for the kingdom of God. But not a single one of them can boast about their works saving them. Because as mighty as they were, that every church is preaching about these people in the past. Peter, James, John, Paul, all of them. As mighty as they were, they were still saved the same way as you and me. 
They cannot boast about getting salvation through their works. No matter how good your works are, they will not save you. There is one way to salvation, and that is to the foot of the cross, asking for the blood, because Jesus paid the price. And through grace and our faith in it, we are saved. That is it. Sometimes we have an issue with our conscience and the things we've done in the past. Hebrews 10, turn with me now to Hebrews 10. When I started this morning, I asked you all to think about, have you ever felt too guilty to pray or that you're not worthy? And sometimes our conscience will condemn us. We hear things like, you're unworthy, you're a sinner, you can't approach God, there's no way he can love you. Look at the things you've done. Look at the things you just did today. And if Romans and that section didn't help, and if Ephesians and that section we read didn't help, I've got another set of verses that should help with the guilt that we have. Let's read Hebrews chapter 10, starting in verse 19. Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh. And having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, For he who promised is faithful. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much more as you see the day approaching. The day is approaching. And this section of verses means that we can approach God no matter what. He wants us to approach and come to the throne. Satan, on the other hand, does not want us to do that. He wants us to think that we can only come to the throne of God in prayer when we have done good or we are worthy, and that's the only time we can ask God for anything. And Satan wants us to think that because he knows that we're never going to feel worthy. And if we messed up, we should not try to even come to God. That's what Satan wants us to think. He wants us to think like Adam and Eve, when they sinned, you should run and hide from God. Revelation 12.10 calls Satan the accuser. And that's what he does if we will let him. But as Jesus said, he is a liar. From the beginning... There is no truth in him. And if we want, we can listen to what Satan says and feel unworthy. Or we can remember what Hebrews 4.16 says, which is come boldly to the throne of grace. It is a throne of grace because we do not deserve it. My dad tells often about when he was younger and how he didn't want to mow the lawn because of his hay fever. I think it was an excuse. Because of his hay fever, I have to use his example because I was a perfect child and I never did anything that he didn't ask me to do. So he always talks about when he didn't mow the lawn, he was worried when my grandpa came home because he knew he was supposed to. But when he did mow the lawn, he was more than happy to greet him when he walked in the door. And I know my grandpa... And I can tell you that if he pulled up into the driveway and the lawn was not mowed, he might have been disappointed, but it doesn't mean he didn't still love my dad. And if my grandpa, who by no means was perfect, still loved my dad, God still loves us. And here's the thing. 
He already knows when we're going to mess up. That doesn't mean we should continue to mess up. But he knows that we're going to. And before we came to the cross, before we were saved, before we asked Jesus into our lives, we knew we were sinners. And from the moment we realized we were sinners and we needed salvation, we came and asked for it. Why would we not do the same every single day, every time we mess up? He already knows we're going to mess up. He's already forgiven us. And he wants us to come to him every day. I titled this sermon, Come to the Throne, because we need to come to the throne daily. And Satan wants to make us always feel the shame and the guilt and to feel unworthy. That is what he wants us to do, because he knows that if we don't come to the throne, even though we might still have salvation, we won't have the good works, which means the person that we were supposed to talk to might not hear it. We need to make sure that our guilt does not separate us from God. Our guilt should make us run to God and to Jesus every time we do it. I'm going to ask for ushers, ushers to come and pass out the communion. And in closing, as they pass out the communion, if you heard nothing else I said today, thank you, thank you. If you hear nothing else that I said today, this is something you need to hear. Through every verse we read, I hope that it got through to come to the throne. Because God wants us to. He wants to share with us. He wants to commune with us daily. And we need to walk in the Spirit. And the more that we come to the throne, the more we will be able to walk in the Spirit. And if you heard nothing else, hear this. We are not worthy to come to the throne alone. We are never going to be good enough to come to the throne of God on our own. No matter what you do, you will never be good enough on your own. It is the blood, the cross, the grace, the love of Jesus that has made us worthy enough to come to the throne. Nothing you do in this life, good, will allow you to come worthily to the throne. Jesus is the one who tore the veil so that we could come boldly to the throne of grace. And if we know that, no matter what I do, I'm never going to be good enough on my own. We should also know, no matter what I do, I'm never going to be bad enough that Jesus can't forgive me and allow me to still come to the throne. That is what we need to remember. And as long as you know that, as long as you know that Jesus has made you worthy to come to the throne, you're worthy through him who made us worthy. And when we know that, we should come to the throne. Because God wants us to come to the throne daily. Let's stand as we take communion. Paul writes, For that I received from the Lord that which I also deliver unto you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread. 
And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And Lord, we thank you for your body. We thank you, Lord, for allowing the stripes to be put on your back for our healing. We thank you, Lord, for you laying your body down to be broken so that while we're on this earth, we can have healing. And in the next life, we can walk with you in salvation. And we thank you for it, Lord. Will you take the body with me? In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And Lord, we thank you. For the precious blood that makes us worthy to come to your throne. That no matter what we've done, sin is sin. There is no worse sin than another. It is all sin in your eyes and it is all covered by the same blood you've already shed. You've already paid the price. For us to have salvation. And I pray Lord. That as we take this cup. If there is anything between us. Any sin. You will remind us. Of it. So that we would come to you. Asking you to wash it away. So that we will once again in your eyes. Be righteous. Will you take the cup with me? Lord, I pray that as we go from this place, you watch over us. I pray, Lord, that as we go through this week, as we go through this month, through this year, that every time we do something that is disappointing to you, any time we're disobedient, any time we sin, any time we do something that the Spirit says, you shouldn't have done that. We boldly come back to the throne of grace, knowing you've already paid the price. Our sins have already been forgiven. There's nothing we can do for salvation that you haven't already done. And Lord, I pray that we come boldly back to that throne every day. That you remind us to feed our spirit, man and to deny our flesh so that we will walk hand in hand with you through the Holy Spirit, guiding us, directing us what to pray for, quickening our bodies so that we will do good works for you and your kingdom while we are here. I ask, Lord, you watch over and protect us. Bring us back at the time appointed. We'll give you the praise for all of it. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you all for being here today.